I'll, I'll be talking about our experience in the last three years of uh, first starting a cohort and then then a trial with the following where most of the design. Um, I should just say this this came as a, as a blessing because back in 2010 I was writing a proposal and I was trying to explain why I, I wanted to do this uh, things this way and then came a paper out that uh, explained it all and I could delete all that and I just quoted it. That was, that was Clara's paper in BMJ in 2010. I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist uh, and I I'm, I'm, I'm work on preventing mental illness. Uh, these are conflicts of interest and our funding. It's actually all competitively funded from either federal or international or provincial sources. Hey. And uh, our aim is to prevent severe mental illness. The, the, by severe mental illness, I'm grouping the diagnosis of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, when they fulfill severe co conditions like being chronic, highly recurrent. Uh, uh, these are the conditions that require hospital admissions that make people unable to fulfill <laughs> their uh, primary roles and ambitions in life. They include psychotic symptoms often, often lead to suicide attempts. So uh, these are Canadian data, it's been calculated that just these three diagnoses combined, they cost uh, the society more than all types of cancer together. Uh, what we know about severe mental illness, it, uh, it definitely runs in families. If uh, someone has an affected parent, that the, the risk is in increased. Uh, between four and eight times, depending how, how we count, what we count. It starts early in life. This is part of why it's so costless and impairing the most typical age at onset is between 15 and 25 years old. Which means that if we, if we want to prevent, we need to go really early on. And there's, there's increasing evidence that the, that the vast majority of cases of serial mental illness can be predicted because it's preceded by uh, earlier, milder psychopathology in a childhood, essentially, childhood and early adolescence. So this means we, we could do indicated prevention. There's reasons for indicated prevention because most of the universal prevention attempts do not actually reach the individuals at the highest risk. And this has two stages, identify who is at risk and then intervene. Uh, our risk identification strategy combines uh, genetic risk, mostly indexed as family history, and what we call antecedents, that's the earlier, milder types of psychopathology, typically fairly common things like mood uh, instability and anxiety, as well as unusual experiences, psychotic symptoms, basic symptoms that are actually more common in children than people like to believe. The, the problem with this is we, we can I mean, we can identify risk early, but uh, most uh, kids and their families at this time are not seeking help. So if we, we, we know that if we wait until they start seeking help, they are already impaired, it's too late. We need to, to be approaching people who are not asking at that point for anything if we want to make a difference. And uh, so we're facing the acceptability challenge. You know, imagine getting a cold call uh, you're not expecting this. We would like to offer you, your daughter, your son, uh, an intervention to reduce the risk of mental illness. You know, how many would, people would say yes to this? Uh, it's uh, interesting to think about. And uh, that there has been actually a randomized control trial following typical <coughs> randomized control trial design in uh, in Netherlands. So they published the design of this trial 2012. Um, that was after we, that was just when we got funding to start a cohort, so, and um, and this was approaching uh, children or parents who have anxiety or depression and offer inter psychological intervention for their children. And uh, two years later, there was a report that this trial was stopped because of lack of uh, enrollment. Uh, they, they screened 11,000, found 1,300 of them were eligible or potential eligible, and ended up randomly allocating 26 of them to either intervention or no intervention. 
So the trial was terminated after fairly major efforts, 30 months of, of major efforts. And, um, and they, they published a paper going into the perception reasons why it, it may be so difficult. And they said when uh, the, the few parents they spoke with, they, uh, they, they had expressed concerns about stigma and, uh, but also preference for intervention that would be actually for the parents rather than for the kids. And uh, well, by this time, be, when they published this, uh, we, we had uh, the intervention trial starting. So, um, you know, had this come out a bit earlier, perhaps we wouldn't be starting it because, you know, reviewers, or we would believe that it's not feasible. Um, so I'll tell you what we did do in our study. So FORBO stands for Families Overcoming Risks and Building Opportunities for Wellbeing. So it's the name for the, for the entire program. Uh, it uh, follows from the beginning, from the onset, the trials within cohort design. So at that time it was described as uh, the maiden name. Uh, and. Um, it is an accelerated cohort, which means that we, we take the youth in at, at, at a broad range of ages. We, we started with ages 4 to 21 years, then extended it down to age 0 when we, when we built the, the, the facility that accommodates um, babies and toddlers safely. And so we now have uh, participants from age 0 to age 21, 20, up to 25, I count the follow-ups. And uh, we follow them up every year. Uh, the aim is to follow everyone up up till age 27. That's after that the onset, the new onsets become relatively rarer. But we we get uh, everyone to consent uh, to linkage with administrative data so that we can eventually also record for later onset hospital admissions. Uh, and uh, there are embedded randomized trials within the, within the cohort. Uh, all the eligibility criteria and outcomes for these trials are in the cohort assessments. And uh, in all cases so far, the comparator is just no intervention being offered. I, I, I'd like to emphasize these are not help-seeking individuals. So I believe this is the, 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 the ecologically valid comparator. This is, you know, care as usual is, is no care. That, that's the difference from, you know, working with patients and doing prevention. And uh, so this is just graphical representation. We have from the onset plan that there would be, would be multiple, multiple trials within the cohort. And we now on the brink of starting a second one indeed. What the cohort looks like, uh, I have descriptions of the first 300. By now you have probably 306. This, this is one month old, 300 youth. 50-50 uh, boys and girls, on average, they are 10 year old when they when they entering the study, and uh, by now we've completed 700 assessments uh, with with very good um, completeness rates. We, we we've been able to follow up 95 percent of the people who entered the study, and uh, approximately equal numbers of parents, and both parents and uh, the children are participants in the cohort, so we're getting consent from parent from the child. <coughs> this is the, many of the parents have uh, mental illness, so they are both controlled, but they are parents with depression, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. Uh, the the interventions that we that we testing, uh, we thought from the beginning that they would depend on the age. There would be different interventions from the early years, perhaps most, more focused on the parents and different interventions for the older children and adolescents, more focused on the young person. We, we also thinking, but we have not started, of some kind of very safe pharmacological, more, more like nutraceutical uh, intervention that may be, uh, may be applicable across the age range. Uh, the, the first uh, intervention that we got funded and we started, it's called Skills for Wellness, or SWELL. And uh, it's a youth-focused, uh, we call it coaching. Uh, it's based on cognitive behavioral therapy, but we don't call it therapy because they're not patients. Uh, it's one one-on-one -on -one individual that was based on research that this would be more acceptable. And uh, we, we have, we, 
we can give 8 to 16 one hour sessions with homework and training in between um, and we call it practice not homework that's the other acceptability tweak uh, over three to four months uh, the the focus is on on, on learning skills and uh, because people are selected into this based on having either anxiety or mood lability or psychotic or basic symptoms, they, it has core modules that everyone does and it has antecedent specific models where we, we work with the small problems that already are present in each one of these. Uh, this is just an example how we how we formulate, and I will not go into the detail, but it's it's to show that you know typically if we do therapy, we would focus on the on the red half of this scheme where we show how problems are being maintained and how we break the sample, the the the, the vicious cycle, and what we do in the swell is we move to the, the green colored size of you know, how to, how to build skills and, and move it to, towards positive well-being and uh, that, that's being practiced. The, the inclusion for this uh, is age 9 to 21 years, that the boundary was chosen, of 9 years was chosen, that's where we, we felt that the youth can be the primary participant, they have the, the intellectual capacity to, to learn and to participate themselves. Uh, if they have one or more of the four antecedents, that's the anxiety, mood, liability, psychotic, and basic symptoms. Uh, for the moment, we only deliver it face to face, so we choose participants that are within one hour driving distance and uh, that they provided consent to participate in intervention studies when they entered the cohort. And exclusions are if they already have severe mental illness or major mood or psychotic <coughs> disorder, but we, we include we include all the milder disorders, so many of these kids already have diagnosable anxiety or ADHD. So we are facing the acceptability challenge, so a lot of normalizing mm -hmm. language, a lot of thought to go into this, how to uh, how to phrase this, and of course the participants already know us, so they're getting a call from the coordinator of, this, of the cohort study that they already are participating in. Um, and I think a big part of this is personal, these are the, the therapists who do the interventions, and so we, we spend lots of time selecting and training so that it's, it's done in a, we be avoiding any disorder terminology, any risk terminology, any therapy <coughs> terminology, so they are coaches. Although they are trained as clinical psychologists, they are coaches, they do practice with the kids to, to learn the skills. Um, so I'll take you through the ethics process as we, as we, we did it. Uh, at least in our university, you, you only go to ethics when a study is funded. So it was not really an option to get uh, the, the cohort and the intervention uh, approved at the same time. Uh, even if we knew exactly what we were going to do. So the, the, the REB approval process for the cohort was separate from the intervention. Uh, that's that when we, uh, when we submitted the cohort, we were very explicit about the, the aim of the cohort being to, to have nested uh, randomized controlled trials. And uh, our consent form included consent to, including consent to be approached that offers of courses and programs that we believe may help some people strengthen their health and reduce the risk of mental health problems as well as use the information you give us to evaluate how useful these courses or programs may be. So that's in the consent for the cohort. And then two years later, there was a separate approval process for the first intervention trial, that's the SWELL. The experience with the first stage was surprisingly easy. So the, our REB has a dichotomy, they classified it as a non-intervention study, although I submitted it as an intervention study. And, uh, and uh, I felt it was given a relatively light review. Uh, they, they required that the, uh, that the <coughs> to be included or not in intervention study, and it's given as an option to the participants. So we did that. So it is uh, now on the, on the signature sheet, they have the option to uh, to agree to be uh, to, to participate in intervention research or not related to the cohort, and everyone says yes. And um, th we have similar options for genetic studies and also for brain imaging studies, and not everyone says yes to genetic studies. 
all brain imaging studies. So the but the all, I think really every single participant said yes about to the intervention studies. So it's the willingness of yes to intervention studies was it implicit that they would have further information about the intervention? Yes, that they would get further intervention if information about the intervention if it's offered. So that's. But uh, it's part of the main concern is that the data is being used to evaluate interventions. That's, that's, that's the main concern. And uh, really most co comments by the, by the REB at that stage um, concerned issues not related to the, to the novel design. They, they, they spoke about burden and privacy and stigma. Uh, the stage two was very different. So n now we submitted the, the first intervention trial for the skills for wellness intervention. Uh, this was uh, rejected twice, so it re required two rounds. This was full board review because this was from the beginning classified as intervention study. That it, it, it actually receives higher level of scrutiny. <coughs> and uh, the, the specific issues in, uh, raised in the first uh, uh, decision was uh, controls need to understand their data use and part and being part and their part in this research and also the board believes that this is not fair for the control group who will not have the opportunity to receive the intervention so uh, it's um, but when it was uh, rejected, I mean, it was never rejected. It was, they always requested revision. So twice they requested revision. On the, on the third uh, meeting, I was invited to come there and explain. And, and I realized that, you know, this, is, uh, this, this was a large committee. There were about 50, 40 committee members in attendance. And, uh, and uh, the, the int I was prepared to, like, explain the rationale of the novel trial. Uh, and I realized these were all very well-meaning people who, who just uh, who were used to be approving studies that kind of fit a pattern, and this was this was just new. And um, and interestingly, we, we, we ended up spending quite a lot of time, but interesting time was spent of essentially mostly explaining the reasons why this needs to be a trial and why the control group is nothing. So we, 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 have, we have gone through the need, you know, we, you know that this is experimental intervention. That, that many people from the board felt, you know, this, this will certainly be helpful. So they were concerned that the, the controls will not get the opportunity. But so I, the, the main argument was, you know, in, well, nobody, nobody's getting anything at this stage. They are not treatment seeking at this stage. So that, that I, I felt like, we needed to justify the, the need for clinical trial rather than just the need for the for the control design. And uh, regarding the new new design, the one argument that really made it across was the the distress and potential harm of being told about a nice intervention and then not get it. So once they once they accepted the the need that there needs to be a control condition, which is nothing. The accepting this potential harm was actually relatively easy for them because they, they all, like half of them are, are lay people, not mental health professionals. And because all of them felt it's, they, they would be disappointed if they, if they are in the, in the control situation. And after this, it was approved with, uh, with requesting only kind of word change, word talk changes. So we, uh, we now into the just starting into the second year of actually doing this intervention. Uh, the experience to date, uh, we have over 300 participants in the cohort. We have a very good retention rate. 95 percent are coming back every year to to, to see us again. Uh, 38 uh, intervention eligible participants have been randomized. We call it selection randomly selection, and 18 of them were allocated to the swell intervention. So that means that, that 18 of them, within about a month after doing the regular cohort assessment, received a call that they were not expecting or about from the coordinator saying, we would like to offer your son, daughter, 
uh, depending on who gave the primary consent. So it, it, for the younger kids, it's usually the parent gave the consent on their behalf, then they would be calling the parent. For the older adolescents and young adults who consenting themselves, we would be approaching the, the young person. So we would like to offer a course to, to, of, of skill learning. And um, so of the 18, 15 have uh, not just accepted but completed it. I mean, uh, two are ongoing, so, so 13 completed, two still in the intervention. Uh, there was actually only one of the 18 who just straight not uh, said, said straight, uh, no, I'm not interested at all. The other two, they met with us once or twice and then decided not to do it. Um, and uh, we, we have had, you know, not, not every participant uh, in the cohort study has been happy. We have had a couple of complaints from participants. Uh, but none of them concerned the intervention. <coughs> by, by far, the, the, the two toughest parts of the, of the cohort are the, the genetic data. Some people, we have two, two families to withdraw genetic data. They don't want anything to be done with the sample. And the other is that we're asking about maltreatment. And we also had a mother who was not happy with the fact that we keep her son's assessment private because she wanted to find out from us whether her son told us that whether he's using cannabis or not. So, you know, it's, we had a few kind of issues to sort out, but not a single one, including either the random selection or the intervention offers. Before, we, we finding that the antecedents really predict severe mental illness. We, we getting, the kids are getting even more ill than we feared. We already had seven, 16 onsets of severe mental illness. In a, in a cohort where the kids were on average 10 year old when they started and being on average full by, by two years. So the, the onsets are obviously in the older half of it, but... What are you including under SMI? This is, this is uh, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, it's, and uh, major depressive disorder, but the major depressive disorder has to be recurrent or severe to meet the criteria. Thank you. And um, so the... The, the risk identification strategy is working. The, this is the, the, the allocation process. I expected to have more eligible participants mm -hmm. for the intervention, but the, the main reasons for the non-eligibility is that we already have too many kids who are already <coughs> ill. And, uh, and then, uh, so actually of the 300, only 126 of them were in this age range. So some of them, they are coming into the, the eligibility age range with further follow-ups. Uh, some of them, they have no, no antecedents. Uh, 20 were out because they, they live too far away. And, and uh, 17 already had a structured psychological treatment in the past year, so they were out. So kind of more ill and more treated than we than we expected in the kind of not given the non clinical recruitment. Can I ask you how many you are aiming for? Uh, we well we, we got funded for a uh, for a, a pilot phase for which we promised forty participants, mm -hmm. so that will be soon completed. Uh, but overall, we we want uh, we want hundred fifty participants in the trial. And um, we planned that we would get them with a cohort of 600, and now it looks like we, you know, we. It may take longer time to get them. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So that just to, you know, we had 83% completion rate. That compares to 2% acceptance and completion rate in the stand, in the trial tried in the Netherlands. And that's this, you know, what that was standard RCTRs was twigs, but there were other things that we were doing differently. And I think it's uh, it's interesting to think how how big part of this was that that our participants did not need to agree to be randomly allocated, rather than this. Um, we're we getting very positive feedback from both the youth and their parents in the in the intervention arm. That, that seems you know we'll, we'll, we need number of years to see the eventual outcome because that's uh, that is long term. Uh, but they are improving on symptoms and and they 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 happy with the with the intervention. Um, my favorite is a girl who said you know I actually changed where I will go for university because 
she's very bright, she, she can choose. And she was going to choose the university where she knows everyone because she, has so, she had social anxiety. And, and now she's going to the best university. So interesting ways it's changing life. Uh, this was one, one kind of uh, challenge I had because we, we received actually quite a lot of interest and media coverage. Mm. And, um, and I, I feel in two minds about it because uh, we, every journalist we speak with, they are most interested in the intervention. They want descriptions of how the intervention is being done, etc. And uh, every time this appears in the media, we had people calling us, they want to take part in the intervention study. But actually, we're not enrolling into the intervention study, we're enrolling into the cohort. So that, that's kind of, uh, you know, I, I'm, I, every time I'm speaking with them, I have on my mind, like, you know, I, we don't want to damage the integrity of the study, the, of the design. And this, I think this is an issue that will be coming up because we are encouraged to speak to the public. So this is, uh, I'll stop here. I think the dichotomy between intervention and non-intervention studies that there's, there is on the REB side that, that <coughs> played an interesting role in the approval process. Uh, that the huge difference in acceptability between this and seemingly very similar trial that, that followed a traditional design was so huge that, I mean, it invalidated the, the other trial. And, uh, and uh, you know the challenges of, of uh, speaking and informing public about what we're doing when uh, when the the design is kind of multi-stage. I'd, I'd be interested in other people's experiences and opinions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I'm Eva Goya. I'm from UMC Utrecht in the Netherlands, and we have been setting up over the past three years three cohorts to run trials in and it's really nice to see another group presenting the first their first experience so thank you for your presentation and it was really nice to see that you encountered the same issues with your IRB as we did and it only worked out after we sat together with them explained them and I think it's really important to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the IRB I have two questions um, you have a really impressive follow-up rate uh, uh, portion of 95% would like to know how you do that. <laughs> and another question is that you aim for 600 participants in your cohort, um, but you also want to run multiple interventions. Aren't you afraid, if you put, maybe it's also a challenge or an interesting thing to, 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 to think about, aren't you afraid that you're going to have individuals who are going to be exposed to multiple interventions who are going to be controlled in one trial? Mm -hmm. How are you going to deal with that? So that's a lot of questions for yeah. which we have very little time. I answered the last first. I actually like the fact of having multiple interventions. They, the, the, the second we got funded, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, prevention of transgeneration, transmission of anxiety. That's actually for a younger age group. So that's for the 100 plus people who are not eligible for SWELL yet. And uh, if we have the the privilege of running the study for long enough, I'll be actually really interested to see the outcome in those people who will, by chance, end up getting both of these interventions. Then, I mean, the, the numbers are small, but the, you know, you know the, the, the parenting intervention in, in younger age plus then individual interventions later. Question for your yeah. Size. Yeah, of course, and I mean, the 600 was the original plan. Now, I, I wish I could say, well, we'll get more, and that's a funding question, essentially. Mm -hmm. So ideally, I would go for, uh, like to go for a larger sample given the, the initial experience. And uh, the, the, the follow-up retention rate, I, I, I trained with, um, with Ashwin Kaspi and Tammy Moffitt who run the Dunedin cohort, and we took all their advice, essentially, in what you do with participants to make them, make them feel well about it. Um, you send them postcards, you, mm. you have kind of ongoing relationship, right? But, I'll probably need to need to stop here. Yeah, I'm happy to chat about details, and you need to do it in Nova Scotia. That's the other part of it. Okay. Let's